The film You're Darn Tootin' demonstrates Laurel and Hardy's peculiar talent for having their private fight embroil the whole town. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Laurel and Hardy Blogcast. Here we are again, all set and ready for another journey into the films of our beloved Stan and Ollie. Thanks for choosing to spend this time with me once again. I'm Patrick Vasey, of course, the author of the Laurel and Hardy blog, and you're listening to episode 17. And today's film under the spotlight is the wonderful silent short, Your Darn Tootin. Now, this promised to be a cracking episode, as we have not one but two special guests, both of whom are recognised around the world as being among the very best in their field. So today's show has something of a musical theme, and if you're familiar with the film, you're Don Tootin, you'll understand why. Uh, And if you're not familiar with it, uh, don't worry, all should become clear as we go along. So I'm really excited to say that joining me to discuss this classic short today, we have none other than fellow podcaster, blogger and host of the silent comedy watch party, Ben Modell, and also radio and TV broadcaster, playwright and world-renowned silent film composer, Neil Brand. Before we dive in, just a couple of thank yous. Uh, firstly, a huge thank you to, I think it's Termimo, I think that's how you say it, uh, for the five-star rating uh, they left me and for the lovely review, which reads, This is an excellent podcast for all who enjoy classic comedy. Not only is there a great deal of information about Laurel and Hardy and their work, but also about their co-stars, and it is all presented with the utmost of admiration and respect for the great duo and their collaborators. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm always so appreciative of all the reviews and feedback, so please keep them coming as it does help to keep me going. Um, and last but not least, um, a big thank you to Roger Robinson from the Saps at Sea Tent in South End here in the UK uh, for sending me a complimentary copy of the Periwinkle magazine. Uh, it's a really nice, well-produced, glossy magazine full of great and rare images, some of them, uh, and stories all about the boys. Um, so if you're in the UK and you'd like to receive copies of this quarterly magazine, you can subscribe for as little as 15 quid per year. Now, I'm sure that you can find them online if you'd like to subscribe, um, but if not, you could always drop me a line, and I'm sure I can put you in touch. So, without any further ado, um, I'm going to grab my bat on, and let's get this show on the road. Your Don Tootin was a two-reeler filmed January 17th to January 27th, 1928. It was released on April 21st, 1928, produced by Hal Roach and directed by Edgar Kennedy. The main cast, Stan Laurel, Oliver Hardy and Otto Lederer. The dawn of 1928 was a busy time for everyone at the Hal Roach Studios and the wind of change was blowing across the lot of fun. In January, following stories circulated in the press about marital problems, Hal Roach took off for an extended vacation and didn't return to Culver City until June. The Star Gazette, a newspaper from Roach's native Elmira, reported the matrimonial discord on January 7th. Quote, Hal Roach, a former Elmiran, has separated from his wife, the former Margaret Nichols, screen artist. Mr Roach said he had every hope that the separation would be temporary. The film producer said that the question of a divorce had not been discussed by them and that he was sure that they could live happily together again when certain matters are settled. The separation was said to have occurred shortly after Christmas. Although the details surrounding the couple's problems were not stated in the report, a contributing factor may arguably have been the amount of time and energy that Roach had to put into his career. Building his comedy empire from the ground up, and being as involved as he was with every aspect of the day-to-day operation, it's not then hard to assume that this may have been a barrier to a complete and loving relationship. Happily, however, just four days after this piece was published, the following article appeared in another East Coast newspaper, the Yonkers Herald, January 11th, 1928. Hal Roach and his wife are reunited. Hal Roach, motion picture producer, and his wife will celebrate their reconciliation with a world tour to be started soon. The global adventure lasted for around six months and appeared to be successful in healing the rift. During his absence, Roach left the studio in his trusted team's capable hands, including General Manager and Vice President Warren Doan, Vice President H.M. Walker, and Supervising Director Leo McCary, whom Roach had recently promoted to the role of Vice President also. As one might expect, even whilst he was touring different continents, Roach kept in close contact with his studio via telegrams with colleagues such as Doan and Fred Quimby at MGM. 
The absent producer ensured he remained abreast of and party to many important decisions that needed making. It had only been a few months since the new distribution deal with MGM had begun. Following a disappointing start, both for the studio, unhappy with the lower than anticipated revenues, and for the distributor, underwhelmed at the quality of the first shorts handed over to them, the situation was now dramatically improved. As the new year began, both sides were now very content with how the relationship was developing. This unsatisfactory start is arguably understandable. The first films Roach handed over to MGM included Max Davidson's What Every Iceman Knows, which the MGM screening committee slated, and Stan and Babe's all-star comedy Sugar Daddies. However, just as things were starting to look a trifle shaky between the new bedfellows, fate stepped in and dealt its trump cards. The saviours of the relationship came in the form of two characters, one fat and one thin, and not only did they save the Roach-MGM partnership, but they also changed the comedy landscape forever. By the time the reviews and revenues for Hats Off, only the third film to feature Stan and Babe together under the new distribution deal started coming in, the tone of the correspondence between MGM and Roach executives was nothing short of ecstatic. Every one of the boys' films was received in often uproariously side-splitting fashion by the MGM screening committee. The praise heaped upon the Laurel and Hardy output was consistently high from both sides. So began the year 1928, with Mr and Mrs Hal Roach freshly embarking upon their twin journeys of geographical discovery and amorous rediscovery, and leaving the studio employees to get used to working without the omnipresence of their boss. It was all changed for Stan Laurel too. He was attempting to adjust to his life as a new father, with baby Lois having entered the world just over a month earlier on December 10th. This period could have been considerably challenging for Stan, as his controversial biographer, Fred Lawrence Giles, in his book Stan, described the comedian as someone who was made nervous by small children. Still, it appears that his new role as a parent suited him, as Giles goes on to say that Stan became a doting father. He carried little Lois to the studio, where she was duly admired. On January 17th, Stan and Babe took up their positions in front of the cameras once again. They began work on their latest two-reel comedy, initially given the working title The Music Blasters, and eventually released as Your Don Tootin. The boy's official biographer, John McCabe, credits a roach gagman with coming up with the initial idea for the picture, having stopped to listen to an orchestra playing in a local bandstand. So Stan and his team of gagmen took this kernel and developed it into the classic short that we know today. The boys are musicians, and we join them playing in an orchestral concert in a very elaborate bandstand, the location of which has been identified by Randy Scretvet as the bandshell in Exposition Park, Los Angeles. Typically, they make a complete hash of the performance and ruin the show, driving the conductor into a frenzy, and they are duly fired from the orchestra. From the chaotic and disruptive scenes at the bandstand, the action moves to the domestic tribulations around the boys' boarding house dinner table. There are some lovely bits of business between the two of them, involving bowls of soup and salt and pepper shakers, the tops of which Stan fails to fasten back on, causing Ollie to empty the entire contents of each into his own bowl. It's terrific Laurel and Hardy, full of character with a heavy emphasis on reaction. All the elements fast becoming their trademarks are here, and all at the Leo McCary-inspired slowed-down pace. The perfect counterbalance to the frantic breakneck speed of traditional and long-established slapstick comedy. Another resident, young Sturgeon, reveals to the landlady that the boys have lost their jobs. Many weeks behind in their rent, and now with no wages to pay her, she throws them out, bag and baggage. Their musical instruments being their sole possessions, they muster what little dignity they can and march out. Taking to the streets, they attempt to raise some cash by busking, but with typically disastrous results. Ollie can't take any more, and it's not long before he begins blaming Stan for all their misfortune. They start a hilarious tit-for-tat fight that quickly escalates, eventually including every spirited male within shin-kicking distance. The scene that the picture is probably best remembered for is this grand finale. It's arguably one of the finest examples of the mass reciprocal destruction endings found in any of the boys' films. As always, it starts small. Ollie, blaming Stan for all that's gone wrong, punches him in the stomach, and Stan retaliates by kicking Ollie in the shins. This tit-for-tat altercation is repeated several times until a passerby involves himself and approaches Stan, who duly kicks him in the shins. 
And so it continues, with more and more people being sucked into the frenzy, kicking shins with wild abandon, while Stan stands relatively unaffected on the sidelines, witness to it all. Unaffected, that is, until Ollie returns to dish out his punishment. Stan's retaliation this time is to tear off Ollie's trousers. Ollie turns around to return the insult, only he tears off the wrong person's trousers, and off we go again, in a hilarious riot of trouser ripping and shin kicking, with a large mob of half dressed guys all leaping on the next uns- unsuspecting passerby. It ends when Ollie finally removes Stan's trousers, and Stan turns and unwittingly rips off the trousers of a street cop, played by Christian J. Frank, who had just arrived mid brawl. The boys quickly exit stage left, and the last we see of them is as they walk out of shot, reunited in friendship, both inhabiting the same pair of trousers, stolen from an unfortunate and rather oversized gentleman. The boys raise their hats in an unusual salute to the audience, then disappear from the frame. The second film in a row to be directed by Edgar Kennedy, Your Don Tootin perfectly captures the very essence of the Laurel and Hardy relationship. For this same reason, in episode 10 of the Laurel and Hardy blogcast, author and expert Randy Skretvet selected Jordan Tutin as the silent short he would take onto his deserted atoll. As Randy explained... Now, right. I was always a little upset that William K. Everson, I think it was, who said that, that uh, Jordan Tutin was episodic. Well, it really isn't, because if you think about it, at the beginning of the film, Laurel and Hardy have... Uh, a job, a means of making a living, a place to live. And over the course of the film, they gradually lose all these things. They, they <laughs> First, they lose their job at the bandstand. Then they yeah. come home to the boarding house and little Sturgeon spills the beans that they lost their job. So the landlady kicks them out. So they've lost the job and the home. Now they're trying to, they're buskers, as you say in England, on the street with the clarinet and the French horn. And through an argument, they lose both of those. <laughs> so they've lost that means, and they almost lose their trousers, and of course they, they, they almost lose their friendship because of the stomach and uh, punching and the shin kicking. Yes. But but at the very end of the film, what happens? They go off together, off together yeah. in that one big oversized pair of trousers, tipping their hats. So yes. it's like that's what survives. It's the one thing that will not be torn apart yeah. is that friendship. No more arguments from now on. No more arguments. That's right. Isn't it silly? Yeah, sure. Just as the decision to make Leave Him Laughing was a brave one, being a silent movie heavily reliant on the contagious element of laughter, one can't help but consider Jordan Tutin was even bolder. In the former case, at least the audience could visibly see the laughter on screen, which was enough to allow the strategy to succeed. However, in Your Don Tootin, the film's first six minutes centre on an orchestra playing a particular yet unknown piece of music. All the gags are musical, and many show musicians blowing into their instruments at specific points, which provides the comedy. These scenes require to be accompanied by a very considered musical score, timed to the action on screen, otherwise there is a genuine danger that many, if not most, of the gags contained within this sequence will be diluted at best, and at worst, completely lost. In his commentary of the film in The Complete Films of Laurel and Hardy, author William K. Everson highlighted this element as the film's handicap. Quote, A variable comedy that gets off to a bad start by relying too much on gags that need sound for punctuation. The precise timing of tapping feet and reactions to single notes of music in the, in the bandstand sequence suggest that originally it may have been planned for music and effects. One can't help but agree with Mr. Everson's suggestion, and although the action in Your Don Tootin cries out for a synchronised music and effects track, it doesn't appear to have ever received one. The discography of American historical recordings confirms that Laurel and Hardy's pictures didn't get that level of treatment until the production of Habeas Corpus, with the score recorded in June 1928, and the film eventually released at the start of December the same year. However, Hal Roach, ever the forward thinker and innovator, was beginning to understand the benefits of pre-prepared musical accompaniment to his films, even as early as mid-1927. In the history of the Hal Roach Studios, author Richard Lewis Ward provides hard proof of this. Quote, Roach and his staff had been present during too many theatrical screenings of their comedies in which the laughter had been drowned out and the comedy blunted by overly frantic musical accompaniment played too loudly. 
Roach decided to have a music cue sheet prepared for each film, with instructions for house musicians to render the score softly, so as not to overwhelm the comedy. Ernest Lutz, head of MGM's music department, complained that the first cue sheet submitted to him by Roach, a score for the Davidson short, What Every Iceman Knows, was far too complicated. Lutz said that the better theatre organists would simply ignore the cue sheet and do their own material. In response, Warren Doan admitted that music was not an area in which anyone at the Hal Roach Studios had any particular expertise. This lack of expertise became a thing of the past after Leroy Shield and Marvin Hatley arrived at the Roach lot around 1930. The iconic tunes they composed for the Roach comedies became as intrinsically recognisable and loved as the actors themselves. But their contributions were still a couple of years away, which meant Roach had no option but to leave the responsibility of musically accompanying the films to each theatre's accompanists. Reviewing your Don Tootin for Motion Picture News, May 12th, 1928, E.G. Johnston acknowledged the creative possibilities presented to theatre operators by the film's very nature, stating, With the musical theme, some good effects might be introduced by your theatre orchestra. And then again, they might not, if they missed the cues. Uh, sadly proving the point of just how vital the correct score is to a silent film, and specifically to your Don Tootin, is the Universal Studios DVD release as part of their 21-disc box set, Laurel and Hardy The Collection. The score appears to be performed solely on an organ, and whilst an attempt was made to match music with the action at the bandstand, it was not done sufficiently to prevent distraction for the viewer. The aim of a silent film score should be to integrate so entirely with the activity on screen that it almost disappears. For example, the rhythm of the screen orchestra must tie in with the scored music. The conductor's foot stamps and baton taps must be in sync with the added sound effects. The sound of Stan's clarinet or Ollie's French horn must be realistic representations of the real thing, or at least be amusing interpretations of them. If not, the score will not complement the picture, it will only succeed in working against it. It's worth noting that the 1967 Robert Youngson compilation, The Further Perils of Laurel and Hardy, showed some care and effort by making a decent attempt at appropriately scoring and synchronising the opening bandstand scene, but this appears to be the exception. For the most successful example, I would recommend seeking out a BBC4 TV series from back in 2006 entitled Paul Merton's Silent Clowns. In the particular episode dedicated to Laurel and Hardy, comedian Paul Merton commissioned the world-renowned composer and silent film accompanist Neil Brand to compose a new synchronised score for your Don Tootin. The result is a score so masterfully considered, timed and executed that it brings the film to life. The music and effects match the action so well that one can easily forget it is actually a silent short. Back in 1928, though, as was becoming the norm, the film was received very positively by theatre owners and exhibitors as their patrons laughed themselves silly at Stan and Ollie's antics, as the following reviews attested. Don't miss this Stan Laurel, Oliver Hardy comedy. It's a cuckoo if ever there was one in this line of entertainment. When an annuid or bored bunch of film reviewers fairly laugh their heads off, even hard-boiled old Jack Harrower, then we'll go the limit toward congratulating this popular roach comedy team and their director, Edgar Kennedy. It's good all the way through, but the choice highlight is the employment of a simple gag, which is admirably built upon to a point where, if it doesn't produce some of the best laughs you ever heard, then put this writer down as one who doesn't know what it's all about. That was from Motion Picture News, May 12th, 1928. Then this from the News Journal, August 2nd, 1928. Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy comedy team are at the Aldine this week. These two frat brothers are engaged in all sorts of real slapstick laughs in a piece called Your Dawn Tooting. It has to do with members of a band, Laurel and Hardy, and the piece is stocked up with laughs. Uh, this one from the New Eagle Theatre, Baltimore, in Exhibitors Herald and Moving Picture World, November 2nd, 1928. Without a doubt, this team cannot be beat. A Laurel and Hardy poster on your front means 20 minutes of real entertainment in your theatre. Uh, the next one laughed myself sick at this one. Metro has the word comedy in a class of its own. We featured this comedy. That was the Rex Theatre, Portland, Oregon. Uh, for balance, it should be noted that there were a couple of reviewers who were a little less than impressed. Uh, from the Lark Theatre, McMinnville, Oregon. Uh, good except finish, which took off the good flavour. 
Uh, and the final one is from the Harrisburg Telegraph, November 6th, 1928. The comedy Jordan Tootin with Laurel and Hardy is almost too slapstick to be funny. But the audience appreciated it nevertheless. <laughs> all in all, Jordan Tootin is a great comedy, and we can say with some certainty that E.G. Johnston's statement turns out to have been spot on, and is worth quoting again here with perhaps one minor and slightly belligerent alteration. With the musical theme, some good effects can be introduced by your theatre orchestra, providing they can be bothered to make an effort. And now it's time for today's first guest interview as we hop across to New York and our special guest, Ben Modell. I'm really excited that joining us as our first guest on the broadcast today is a man who I know will be very familiar to many of you, Ben Modell. Ben is one of the leading silent film accompanists in the US, working full-time presenting and accompanying silent films on both piano and theatre organ. For over 30 years, Ben has created and performed live scores for several hundred silent films, lasting anywhere from one minute to five hours. Um, I'll ask you about that in a minute, Ben. As well as, perform- as well as performing in various venues across the US and internationally, he is also a resident film accompanist at the Museum of Modern Art, New York, and at the Library of Congress. He has composed film scores for both orchestra and concert band for accompaniment to films by Chaplin and Keaton, and his recorded scores can be heard on numerous DVD Blu-ray releases, including three Babe Hardy shorts on the recent Lobster release, Laurel or Hardy. And if that's not enough, Ben also has his own indie DVD level, um, uh, well, pfft, his own indie DVD label, Undercrank Productions, and through it he has released several DVD sets of rare or lost silent films. The most recent being the collected silent shorts of Edward Everett Horton. Over the past eighteen months or so, his face and voice have now become a regular feature of many people's Sundays. As along with his partner in crime and fellow friend of the broadcast, Steve Massa, he produces and hosts the brilliant weekly show, The Silent Comedy Watch Party, over on YouTube. So it is my absolute pleasure to say, Ben Modell, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy Blogcast. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. It's brilliant to have you, Ben. Brilliant, and um, I've got to say, it, it feels like. I've known you forever. This is the first time we've actually met, but it feels yeah. like you yeah. know, I've known you for, for a good couple of years now, thanks to your, to your yeah. watch party. Well, I've been a weekly fixture in people's houses yes. since March of 2020. So absolutely, it, yeah. absolutely. And, and well done on that. I mean, what I, what I like is the fact that your um, watch parties and my podcast started pretty much at the same time. So between us, I think we've kept people well entertained over the COVID uh, sort of lockdown. So uh, mm. congratulations to you. I mean, well, weekly show. Well, thank you very much. Thanks so much. It's a lot of hard work, I know. Um, you know, I do it once a month, and that's 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 plenty for me. So what you guys yeah. have been doing is just phenomenal. So congratulations on that. Thanks. Um, and I particularly enjoyed, I've got to say, the um, the program you did um, a few months ago with Rob Stone and Serge Bromberg on yeah. the Alan Hardy set. It was great. It was great to have them on. You know, once we figured out, once I figured out how to bring in people uh, remotely, besides Steve. Yeah, uh, we, and we knew that this project, this this um, this box set was coming out. We wanted to bring bring uh, both Rob and Serge on to talk about the films, and we were very pleased to be able to get the okay, not just from Serge and from from Lobster Films in the Library of Congress, but also from Flickr Alley to share yeah. shorts that were on 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 the set yes. uh, with our our viewers. Yes, absolutely. It was a great great program. Did you get good response uh, to that one, Ben? Yeah. Yeah, we we get res- good response to pretty much any time we have one. Uh, we have a special guest or guests on, right? Uh, but that particular show, uh, it was just great to to be able to to share that with people and for people to get a, a good look at some of the restorations. And we we yeah. hope that that it's helped sell some copies. Absolutely. I mean, I think that you know the the thing with. Um, the early solo films, I mean, even with the silent films, Laurel and Hardy's silent films, they, they're overlooked a lot of times by many fans, and the solo films particularly, even more so. So to be able to shine this light on them now and, and to present them in such wonderful quality, um, and I think your watch party just gave people the opportunity to have, you know, taste before you buy kind of thing, and it was, yeah, sure. fabulous. Really, really good. So fantastic yeah. stuff. Um, right, now... Um, it, like I said, it's really brilliant to have you on finally, Ben. I've been saving you. I've wanted to get you on for quite a while, and I've been oh, saving you for the, <laughs> yes, I've been I've been saving you for this particular episode because today we're looking at your Don Tooting. 
Ah. Um, and I listened to your um, silent film music podcasts, oh. uh, which, which I enjoy. Oh, um, thank was... you. I got to get back on that. But <laughs> between my schedule and the, the gentleman who's come on board as a co-producer, his schedule, we, yeah. we just haven't been able to get an episode together for a while. But we'll, we'll be getting on that hopefully by the end of the year. Well, you haven't, you haven't been slacking, Ben. It's fine. Oh, it's, I, I think right. we can let you off. You've been all right. Oh. You've been busy. <laughs> we can tell. All right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you did, a, you did a particular episode on there where you talked about your Don Tutin and a particular score that you'd, I don't know if you'd composed it particularly for that one or if you played it off, you know, off the, off the it, cuff. It's, yeah. Um, if it, I, don't remember the specific episode, but I know that when with with your darn tootin, there is a certain thing that I do with it that I've been doing since the first time I I had to play for it at a show back in the late nineties. Right. Uh, so that must be what I was talking about. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so we'll come on to that in a, in a little in a little while. But what I, what I love to do with with guests, uh, for certainly first time guests, is just to find out initially um, about um, how you discovered Laurel and Hardy in the first place. Um, you know what your earliest memories of them are. So if you could start off with that, Ben, that would be great. Yeah, uh, I don't know that I have a very specific memory of uh, how I first encountered Laurel and Hardy, but I would have to imagine that it was because they're their talkie shorts were on television when I was a little kid. I discovered silent movies, I am told, by my parents when I was a toddler, initially discovering Charlie Chaplin because uh, his films were on often as kids kids programming or filler. Uh, and so growing up during the 1960s and the 1970s, the Laurel and Hardy package was on television. So I saw them that way. Um, I knew who they were. I was got uh, the films of Laurel and Hardy by William K. Everson as a gift. Uh, one of the first films I bought an 8mm on a half-price sale from Blackhawk Films was Double Whoopi. All right. And so uh, that's the, that's really what my earliest memories uh, of, of them were. Uh, not being as aware of their, their silent films initially, uh, the big deal when, when I moved up into Super 8 and Super 8 Sound was especially once I had a paper route and could afford Super 8 sound films was to buy, you know, busy bodies in, in Super 8 magnetic sound or, or, or any, any, one of the, any of their other uh, two real comedies. And that was just such a, it was just because this was a time before home video where the only way to see more or see anything again, whenever you wanted to was to own a film print right, or know a collector. Yeah. <laughs> Not many of us knew a collector, unfortunately. Not not over this yeah. uh, side of the pond, in any case. Sure. Um, so, um, were you were you sort of drawn to any particular comics at that period? I mean, is, did you have particular favourites? Or I think that there was there was a moment uh, when I just became nuts for Buster Buster Keaton. Yeah, and that's probably around age, you know my early teens uh, when I really started to discover his films. Uh, not just from uh, there was a program that aired in the U.S. in the late in the early to mid '70s in two different series I think called the Silent Years, uh, produced by Killiam Shows, and so the General and I think Cops and some other uh, of, his, of the Keaton films were shown on there, and I, I know I definitely saw Keaton's films that way. I bought a you know a print of Cops with Gaylord Carter's theater organ score, which is still baked into my me- memory. Et cetera, et cetera. Fabulous. Is, and then <laughs> uh, the the other thing that happened, and this is the way I got to see pretty much all of Keaton's features before I got to film school, is that uh, when I was 12, I got a copy of this book. It's going to come out blurry, although my hand, I don't know. You know what I'm talking I about. I know. It's like see it. The Silent Clowns by Walter Kerr. Yeah. And... Um, my folks remembered reading or hearing somewhere that Walter Kerr lived in our town All with right. his wife, Jean Kerr, um, known, if anything, for writing something called Please Don't Eat the Daisies about her life uh, with a, a theater critic and their kids in this big old house. Right. And and this is going to come out blurry also. That's Walter Kerr. Uh, I wrote him a letter. Uh, we didn't have his address, but it's, it, it's at his, his house, that big... 
seems to need that Daisy's house is at the end of this one particular drive beach Avenue right on the water. So I just, it, it's not a big town. And our, our, our letter carriers knew where the Kurs lived. And I wrote him a letter telling him of my deep interest in silent film and silent comedy film. And then I had heard he had a collection and would he be willing to show me films? Uh, <laughs> and he called us a few days later and he said he would be happy to. And for the next, I don't know, 15 or more years, always on a Monday night, because uh, he was a theater critic and theaters were dark on Mondays, I would go over to his house. Wow. Uh, either either my folks would dr- drive me and a friend over, or I'd ride my bicycle over. And, I, you know, he would just show me whatever. He would just, well, what do you want to see? So <laughs> that that fed, fed my interest. And... Um, I'm sure he didn't have, he had a number of Laurel and Hardy films. Uh, I am, I'm sure, I know he had a print of Wrong Again. Right. And, and uh, Music Box and some other things. And I'm sure that along with the f- features of Keaton and Langdon and Lloyd and Chaplin, I saw there, uh, I'm sure I saw some of the Laurel and Hardy shorts there as well. So um, that's just, you know, I, that's part of my story. It's uh, that's brilliant. Um, but that, that was the way, you know, I got to see more, more, more of Keaton. Yeah, yeah. And would he, would he sort yeah. of talk to you about the films as well, or did you know? Was it? Yeah, just a- he wasn't as you know. What was, what was interesting, at least in terms of my own experience, was that uh, as as brilliant a writer as he was, he didn't talk all that much. I would have to ask right. him questions. Okay. Um, I've seen interviews with him where he speaks very eloquently, but I, uh, I don't rem- I, I It's it's been a long time, but. Um, uh, he would tell you know, he, or he would show the film, and he had he sat in the back of the room smoking fine cigars, and he had a reel-to-reel tape deck where he'd cobble together uh, scores from instrumental recordings, and would call out points of interest. You know, that's where Keaton broke his neck and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, in between films, he would give me points of interest, or I would ask him uh, things about it. But it was really. Uh, about my getting to see the films, and I think not just for me, but for him also, it meant a lot to him. I, as I found out after he passed away from from his his youngest uh, child, his daughter Kitty, that it it meant a lot to him to be able to share that. And that's a big. I think that's something that has either de- uh, deliberately or not, or subconsciously driven a lot of what I do right. today and over the last ten twenty years. Uh, uh, what I do both in, in producing and distributing DVDs and even in doing silent film accompaniment and shows isn't about music work. It's about, for me, sharing more silent film with other people. Even if all that's, that's happening is that I've been hired to play for something, I think of it as I'm I'm helping this film yeah. uh, get to an audience and not, uh, oh, here's an opportunity for me to play whatever. Yeah, yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's a lovely, what a lovely story. That's really nice. Yeah. Um, so, so where did um, where did the musical um, side of things start to attract you, Ben? Where, where did that uh, begin? Well, it started. I mean, it started really in college. I had been playing piano since I was five and took piano lessons. I was not uh, conservatory material uh, by any stretch of the imagination, and I went to film school. I was a film production major. I wanted to make movies, but I was also in when I was looking for colleges. I was looking at schools that also had a good music program because I had I had played saxophone and bass clarinet in band and stage band growing up. So I had these two concurrent things running with a, an interest in silent film. And the the part of the story that I don't understand is that. Uh, my sophomore year, the beginning of my sophomore year, my second year of college, I had this idea to accompany the silent films being shown in the film history class. Because for all film production majors, there was a film history class you had to take. Uh, first semester, silent. Second semester, sound up through the 1950s. And this is, again, uh, early 80s, before, right before home video. So everything is shown on 16 millimeter. And these films don't have tracks, and they're shown in dead silence. And I do remember thinking, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> and it bothered me that these films were just kind of sitting there in dead silence in yeah. front of film students every week. And the other thing, this is, again, the part that I don't understand is that 
I had never done a piano recital. I had, I mean, there were band concerts and stuff like that, but I was extremely uncomfortable performing as a soloist in front of other people. I was extremely un uncomfortable anything with other people anyway. And so the idea of, oh yeah, I'll just uh, play music for silent films in front of a uh, hundred or so film students without having written scores or rehearsed stuff, I don't <laughs> understand why I thought that was a good right. idea. Wow. Okay. But I went to the head of the department who loved the idea, a guy named Brian Winston, who's from England, uh, and he loved the idea, and I began playing uh, there. And so wow. that's when it, it, it started. And um, unlike most of, most of my colleagues who are film accompanists who uh, started playing for a film club at a university or at school and they were it was it was usually a feature like Hunchback of Notre Dame or Phantom of the Opera or they yeah. generalized started off you know with the Lumiere brothers yeah. and we eased myself into Caligari <laughs> and uh, the crowd and Battleship Potemkin uh, so uh, and I met people in New York City who were accompanying films because I figured I don't know what I'm doing right uh, uh these people do. And I met uh, William Perry, who had been uh, the, the pianist at the Museum of Modern Art since around 1969, and had also scored all the Killiam Show's Silent Years uh, pro uh, productions, and was still playing at MoMA, but, uh, and a few other people. But for me, most importantly, I met Lee Irwin, who had been a movie organist in the 1920s. All right. And he and I became friends. He became a mentor, wow. not in a didactic way, but... Uh, I would just pelt him with questions. I would, ah, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? I have a, I'm playing for this film. It has a scene like this. What do you do? What should I do? And he would, you know, answer my questions and sometimes listen to music I had come up with or suggest things. And that was a huge help for me. And so between that and the fact that I wound up uh, by uh, my second, some either the second half of my second year or third year, Accompanying films for William K. Everson for Bill Everson's classes. Wow! Uh, I was, you know, I went from having a couple of his books in high school to playing for his classes, where <laughs> I was playing for, I was playing for two features a week. So, uh, uh, and that plus the basic film history class taught by Robert Sklar was like silent film accompaniment boot camp. But I had the, what I call the my the three Godfathers. You know, Walter Craig showed me films. Uh, I was playing for Everson's classes and getting advice. Uh, from from Lee Irwin, so all these three things informed me uh, in terms of my film accompaniment work. Although I was still for the next ten or fifteen years a aiming to be a filmmaker. Right. Okay. So you yeah. So you wanted to m actually make films rather than accompany them. So so when yes. when did the penny drop that you think this is what you actually want to do as a career? Well, I hit a wall uh, maybe twenty five thirty years ago. I had produced and directed a no-budget independent feature film that had been released, well-reviewed, but ran for three weeks. Uh, was having a lot of meetings, uh, but my friend whose stand-up uh, material I had adapted into a film with him, we, we got to this point where we would say to our agent, could we get paid for the meetings? Because we're killing in the meetings <laughs> when we don't actually book anything. Yeah. I had done uh, improv, I had done stand-up, and sketch wow. material and just was banging my head against the wall. And there was a moment where I realized that anything I'd ever done with silent film had just sort of worked out. And I, it was like, this was the path of least resistance. And I thought, well, let's go through that door since it's, it's sort of, and I'm banging my head against the wall with everything else. And I guess at some point I'll come back to it. And yeah, I guess it was some point in the in the the mid nineties, nineteen nineties that I decided. All right, let me just concentrate it on this, and uh, it 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 took a long time to very slowly and gradually snowball, but it be it became uh, what I did for a living. I was doing that and tuning pianos and doing some tech support work, and then uh, it just it just became the silent film work. That's brilliant. That's amazing. As you say, it's sort of almost divine intervention that it's sort of guided you that way, you know, brilliant. Divine or just just noticing the way the my path was going mm. and and uh, 
and and honoring it and and uh, and uh, leaning in to the things that were yeah. that were working. And then I'm because of what I've been between my research on on silent filmmaking and what I've learned from the circus and clown uh, uh, and physical co- comedy performers. Uh, I've I've worked together with over the last ten years. I'm slowly and gradually, hopefully, mo- making my way back to filmmaking. Oh, lovely! That's brilliant. I hope so. Um, so, sort of bringing it back around to to Laurel and Hardy, and I sure. guess just to the Hal Roach Studios in general. How much of an influence was the sort of the music of of Leroy Shield and Marvin Hatley to you as as you've gone forward? Well, it's certainly an influence in terms of how I uh, think musically when I accompany a Laurel and Hardy film. Uh, not not so much for the solo shorts, uh, but you know, part of what I do as a film accompanist is keep in mind what an audience is expecting to hear. Uh, I don't. I, I am also very much aware that I want to disappear. This is one of Lee Irwin's big rules: is you want. He said the best thing you can hear from somebody after a show is, "I forgot you were playing." The, so that the music has to not only be seamless but be so. Uh, organic that the audience just forgets that there's somebody there doing it uh, so that it fits like a comfortable old sweater. And while I may not play in the style of what we know from the early 30s uh, Laurel and Hardy comedies, people, especially fans who know the films, expect that sound. And even if all I do is I play it in the first few minutes of the film, so it's... Re- it's uh, familiar and an, an audience the you know in the first few minutes of any film score you want to reassure the audience uh that they're in for a good time uh that the accompanist knows the style of what's going on uh only o- only so that as an audience you can go ah okay i can just watch this movie i don't have to line anything up uh with what what, what i'm watching the idea is to bring people up and into the world of the film and and keep them up there so I may break some some uh, uh, anachronism. I mean, I may do some anachronistic things, but uh, it, it's once I let the audience know I'll meet your expectations, they can relax and enjoy the film. So, yes, the March of the Cuckoos wasn't used. I know it wasn't used in their films till a certain point in the early 1930s. But when the, a title card. Uh, hits the screen that says Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy in From Soup to Nuts, and you hear... Ah, I, see, this is why I don't play the piano enough. <laughs> There's Perfect. an audible response yeah. from the audience. You you can almost hear people go, ah, like, yeah. oh, it's an old friend. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. And so I know I probably shouldn't, you know... Maybe I shouldn't because it's no, audiences wouldn't have heard that in 1928. Um, but I, the, the the reaction in the room and the vibe in the room, uh, it, it's it's this this uh, it's this uh, group reaction of everyone realizing, oh, we all love this, and they, yes, oh, our that's two it. our two these two friends of ours are coming just because of that that music and. Yeah. Uh, sometimes coming out of the t- opening titles, I will, in that first title card, the Mr. Laurel had this, or Mr. Hardy, blah, blah, blah. Or this is the story of two people who... I'll play something that sounds like Leroy Shields' cue that isn't one. Right. Just so, again, to welcome uh, people up into the world of the film and reassure them, yes, this is a Laurel and Hardy comedy. You're not going to have to... Oh, what what are they playing? And then I'll I'll move on. Uh, so the 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 you know having uh, especially the Bohunks CDs to listen to uh, over and over to in, ingrain that style and that sound into my head uh, c- certainly helps uh, as far as so the, as far as the the Marvin Hatley and the Roy Shields music that that's where uh, the, if there's an influence and between that and what what, what the few quotes I've read uh, by Stan about the use of music uh, and what kind of music he liked to have uh, also in, also informs me uh, right. as well. But so it's, it's that combination of what was done in the early 30s yeah. that may inform me uh, t- 
to some degree in, in terms of setting a tone and reassuring the audience so they can forget yeah. about me and just enjoy Stan and Ollie. Yeah, that's lovely. So your Don Tootin is kind of very early 1928. Mm-hmm. So when when you decided to to put your score together for mm-hmm. your your Don Tootin, how did you how did you sort of go about doing that? How did you set your stall out? Um, well, the the there's really just one thing that I did for it, and the the one score that where I deliberately sat down and wrote out a complete score was for uh, I did, I did an orchestral score for Wrong Again, and I can talk about that also. But I'll tell you. Uh, the thing that I did with, with your darn tootin, and again, this is another anachronistic thing that maybe I shouldn't do. And I don't like doing things that call attention to themselves, but it's such a fun inside joke. So the first time I watched uh, your darn tootin in preparing to play for it, this is in 1998, there's a scene on the, the sequence on the bandstand, and the conductor goes, one, two, three, four. Bum, bum. And we cut to the trumpet player. Bum, bum. Then there's a, a, a sigh of relief from the conductor. And then, and one, two, three, four, yum, bum. Cut to the trombone player. Bum, bum. And I thought to myself, you know, that sounds like... Bum, bum. I'm singing this song. Put the coffee on. The old spinning wheel was written a few years later, you know, just before it turns up in in Them Thar Hills. And I knew the tune from Them Thar Hills. Uh, And then there's the, the little quoting of it in Tit for Tat. And I thought, huh. I wonder, and so sometimes I do, I don't play, it's a film I don't play for all that often, but when I have, uh, especially uh, maybe five or six years ago, I had an opportunity to play for a few uh, Laurel and Hardy silent comedies at a meeting of the Sons of the Desert in New York, and I, right. I played that yeah. uh, for that sequence, because it's, it, it's almost like, what else would you put in there? <laughs> it's, it's, it's this very strange time warp, because it's very, it's very clear that what's supposed to happen is something goes done two, three, and bump bump, and then yeah. this answer bump bump. <laughs> so uh, then the other thing that I'll do with the same theme is vary it um, when they're out on the when they're out on the street. There's this actually no, I don't do it with with that. But there's a moment when the when the pants ripping starts, uh, then I just turn it into a chase music. <laughs> Et cetera, et cetera. Because I can't, I can't, like I said, I can't really play the piano. Um, but, and often I've found that if I take a piece uh, of music or melody and play it in a different tempo or meter, the, uh, when I've talked to audiences afterwards, they didn't realize I did that. You know, if I take something that's a wall to play it as a two step, they don't realize it's the same piece. And the Roland Hardy fans probably rec- recognize the tune and hear me bring it around for the big fight, and it sort of ties together. It's nice, the yeah. Beginning. Yeah. Um, uh, I, the other thing that I'll do is, uh, you know, the, the sequence where the two of them are performing as street musicians. Uh, you know, you have to meet the film where it is, and and so there's the 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 counting off. And the, that one, two, three, and then oh yes, this, this, <laughs> yes. this running gag. So um, you know, in in the you know, I've come up with a melody which I I won't be able to pull up out of my head right now, that uh, that fits that. And one, two, three, and hold, and one, two, three, and then when 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 they're they aren't starting and stopping, it becomes this melody. Something something along those lines. Um, so, so I, that's really the only thing specifically I'll do when I when I accompany the film. And if 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 I 
you know, one of the advantages to um, improvising or to not being uh, uh, stuck to uh, or uh, you know playing the exact same score at every show is that I can walk into a particular audience and knowing the audience, um, I can change things. So I, f I figure, oh, the old spinning wheel is going to go right over people's heads. No one's going to know. And then I don't have to worry about playing it and or, or getting all the notes right, which I can't do, like you just heard. Uh, or if I think that it's if it's it's too obvious, I can I can uh, I can adjust I can adjust it. Uh, but the but gosh, you know, you watch that film. What else can you possibly? It's it's, it's the weirdest. <laughs> It's the yeah. weirdest thing. I don't know what else. I don't know what people did in cinemas in 1928. And uh, uh, but I would imagine if if I if I had to record or if I had to compose a, a deliberate orchestral score for it, I would come up with something that works the same way, but I wouldn't have to clear the rights to. Yeah. yeah. Yes. One, two, <laughs> three, and bump them. It, it's just so <laughs> deliberate and specific. Yeah. Uh, in the close-ups and the gesturing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very, and what, what a strange film to actually make as you know in this silent period. You're going to put yeah. a film out with all that very specific, you know, it's it must have been a yeah. nightmare for for organists or you know yeah. piano players in the day thinking, what am I going to do here? <laughs> well, it, it was probably a, a bigger challenge uh, to orchestras unless it was it was uh, 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 something uh, unless. Uh, the conductor would just have a music bed going. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, it, it depends on, on the, you know, on, the, on, the, on, on, on how, how meticulous they would have been. Some uh, organists and pianists probably by the second or third show could probably have nailed it. I, I am now myself able to, in watching a film, I can, uh, if I want to, not in a Mickey Mousing sound effect kind of way, but I can make things musically land uh, on, on a hit. If if it's if I feel like it's gonna make the gag go over well, or if it's a, in, in a drama, have something uh, resolved to something. Because if you if you're watching and you're watching the wind up, uh, and you're loose enough and ready enough, you can make things make things fit. So I, I would have to imagine that, especially organists who were improvisers, could very well uh, by their second or third go at at at, at that you know on on the Monday the picture had come in pretty much nailed a lot of those hits. Gotcha. Like when the conductor falls over on the bandstand, he does that sort of two or three times, isn't he? So yeah, he, yeah, yeah. And there were definitely some orchestras that had sound effects, you know, sound yeah. effects instruments, and or not just hitting hitting a rim shot or something like that. But there were right. lots of things you could do. Right. Oh, that's really interesting. That's really good. Um, so, oh, I was going to ask you. When you when you're playing the uh, the spinning wheel, do people mm -hmm. sing along? Do do, they, do you get no, the pom poms? Or do they not? That that hasn't happened yet. I mean, I wow. I've only did the one show at a Sons of the Desert meeting, so oh, I'm so disappointed. It, it doesn't. Yeah, and 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 uh, uh, I I haven't I haven't uh, you know usually my go to short has been wrong again for a number of years. I show it to my my students, uh, the film history uh, side of the film class that I teach. I show them. Uh, wrong again. It's one of my favorites, and the reason I show it to my students is that because most of a good deal, uh, at least a good deal of the the dramatic action is reaction shots, and it's it's a unit I do toward the end of the semester where I show uh, my students Lady Windermere's fan, which also is driven by people looking at each other and go, "What is this? What is that person up to? What's that mean?" And wrong again is the same way. Plus, it, it wrong again is just a, a brilliant, brilliant short. So it's yes. Um, I you know, uh, if I have to show w one short, I it, it always kills. And so um, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't gotten around to your your darn tootin' just yet. But hopefully, <laughs> once we can start doing shows again, yeah. I can I can put that into the mix. Yeah, are you back on the road yet, Ben? Are you are you yes. performing? Ah, yeah, I, I began uh, doing in person performances in July. Um, the Museum of Modern Art did a, a show outdoors in their sculpture garden of the new lobster restoration of our hospitality. Oh wow! And I played for that. That was the first time I had played in person, and was really I. That was the first silent film show to happen uh, in New York City since the shutdown, and then. 
I've 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 done a number of shows at the Museum of Modern Art, but I was at uh, a, uh, a space that was a former uh, church uh, up in up in Vermont, and I'll be back in November. I have stuff coming up, uh, so I yeah, people are. Uh, you know, it's it's late September 2021 when we're doing this and people are making plans. They are also aware that at any given moment they may have to not have those plans happen. Um, and at any given moment, they may be able to have more people in the theater than they figured. And so in every every part of the country in the U.S. is different. And I'm sure it's the same in the U.K., uh, depending on. You know, we all turn on the television in the morning and see what we can do. Yeah, I mean, this is why we moved the the silent comedy watch party from a weekly live stream to bi-weekly with repeats from. I mean, we have you know sixty eight other episodes now uh, in between because I was starting to get booked for shows, so I'm trying to balance them. You know, every other week, and I'll go out of town to do something every other week. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, just getting uh, back onto your Don Tooting, Ben. Just, what are your thoughts generally on this on this film? I mean, you obviously you're very familiar with many many films. Um, yeah. How do you think your Don Tooting sits with uh, in the Laurel and Hardy canon, but also just generally? Oh, it's you know, uh, it's it, it's it's. I don't want to rate it. You know, it it, it it's like the. There are a couple of, of the silent two reelers that are, aren't as strong as the rest, but most of them are excellent. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's an interesting film in that it takes a while to get off the ground. It's got a very slow build. And I think one of the reasons I, prog- I was programming it less is that because of that, I want people to be laughing, uh, at right off the bat and, uh, there are other shorts that get that going right away. Uh, and your Darn Tootin is great for built-in fans. Uh, so if you're doing a program of Laurel and Hardy shorts, you put that maybe in the middle uh, somewhere, or, or it's got such a big build at the end. But there's a way to pace it when you put together a program. But um, So if I had to show one Laurel and Hardy short, I, I might pick something uh, else, uh, but... In terms of the filmmaking and the style, it's it's excellent. It is a it is a slow build, uh, but once it once it gets go, you know, it's it's like safety last. You have to have those first three or four reels for people to be screaming with laughter and terror uh, for for the building climb. So for the pants ripping and shin kicking sequence in the last four minutes, you have to have the build that happens. And what's what I what I enjoy about it is. A lot of this stuff I, I love about your darn toot is the, the, the very slow, like the scene at the table uh, with Stan Babe, uh, um, very carefully and very slowly, the whole business with the pepper and everything, um, and uh, the seriousness with, with which they take everything. Yes. You know, we go, yeah. but, you know, and all, and, and all, and all, and all <laughs> that stuff. Um, it's just, uh, you know, brilliantly paced and, and staged, and it's a, such a nice mix of, of, of physical slapstick and character-based stuff. Thank you, ma'am. So, just to uh, to bring us on to um, talking about favorite films, mm. I wanted to ask you our atoll question. Um, it's a little bit of a tricky one. So, you are about to be stranded on a deserted atoll, Ben, <sighs> but you are being allowed to take with you four Laurel and Hardy related items with you, and I'm going to give you a bonus item as well. So, you have a Laurel and Hardy silent short, a talky short a feature film, and a Laurel and Hardy-related book, and also you can have a favourite piece of Laurel and Hardy music, either Shield or Hately. Oh, gosh. Uh, uh, so let's, let's start with this. I, I, can, I can give you what my top picks for... If I was going to be stranded on a desert island, I'd really have to put a lot more thought into this. <laughs> I get this question a lot just in general at shows, uh, uh, not in terms of Laurel and Hardy, but along with "Don't Your Hands Get Tired," it's like, do you have a favorite film to play for? No, I, I really don't. They're all great. Yeah. Um, it is. Uh, they're, they're, it's an I, impossible I think question. Top, I have things that at the top of my list of the silence. Uh, yeah, uh, wrong again. Yeah. And um, for talkie shorts, it's it's hard to it's really hard to pick. I I I have I I have a soft spot for busybodies. There's something, yes. you know. Uh, I I there. 
one of the I'm kind of drawn to films with a nonlinear narrative where there is no deliberate plot. I, I like yeah. the I like Jacques Tati's films and films, you know, the, the Laurel and Hardy shorts that I as much as the other ones are lots and lots of fun, but the ones where it, it's just the two of them at work in a lumber mill, moving a piano, painting a boat, and you just get to hang out with these guys. Would you mind opening the window? Not that one, this one. I can't get my hands out. Well, I like Busy Body and, and for the same reason, uh, as great as Sons of the Desert and Way Out West are, I, I really like Blockheads. I don't know why. Come here. Why didn't you tell me you had two legs? Well, you didn't ask me. Get in the car. Well, I've always had them. I don't know. You are better now. You know, I, I, I worry about them when they get into trouble with your, <laughs> you know, they get into really, really bad trouble with their yeah. wives. Well, you, you, you these, 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 their wives are these lovely women. And you wonder why are they trying to get away from them <laughs> yeah. so much? <laughs> They're um, not always lovely. <laughs> yeah, not, not, not always, but you wonder <laughs> how do they, then how do they wind up together? And, yeah. um, uh, but, um. As far as I, I, a piece of music, I, I couldn't. I, it's, it's really hard, hard to pick. Oh come on! I'm sorry, I, I don't know them <laughs> by type. I don't know them by name. Oh okay, all that okay, well. that's fair enough. That's fair um, enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, I book. don't know them by name. A, a Laurel and Hardy book. You can have a book. A book. Oh, I don't yeah. know the book. I don't know the books. Oh, I tell you what. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, well, I'll I don't know. Bit. I don't know the books well enough to be able to to to, to pick one or have. Uh, uh, an opinion about one. Rob Stone will be upset that I didn't pick Laurel or Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but um, what, about, what about just a cinema book? A book on a cinema, silent film. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, probably the parade's gone by. Oh yeah, nice the parade's choice. gone by. It would be a toss up between the parade's gone by and the silent clowns. Yeah, I think that's good choice. Yeah, good choices. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, excellent. And and just to uh, just to bring it to a close. Um, I mean, you are a man of many, many parts. Do you have any projects that you're currently working on, Ben, that you'd like to just plug whilst you've got our ears? Uh, I, I have a number of projects, but they're, um, I don't like talking about them until they're really concrete. Yeah. And even even with my Kickstarters, my rule of thumb is until I have, I'm have, i holding a hard drive with the files on it, <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. say anything. Um, Fair enough. There, there are... There are a number of projects I'm, I'm work, I, I have in mind for myself, and uh, we're collaborating with other other people on as far as releases. Um, yeah. the, the you know the big thing, of course, and this is not going to come out sharp and clear, but the Edward Everett Hall, there it is, the Edward Everett. Oh, there it is. A, come on, it's a face. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Zoom. My fingers look better. Anyway, there he is. The Edward Everett him. Horton uh, uh, set. It's something I'm really pleased with how well it's come out and the and the re- response uh, we've we've uh, we've gotten to it. I've been in touch with the Slapstick Festival about doing a program of Horton comedies oh, uh, for for next year. Um, uh, got a very nice note from Kevin Brownlow about it the other day. I sent him a copy of it, uh, but just uh, very pleased uh, with uh, the work that everyone. Uh, who worked on it? Not it did not just just the music, but uh, yeah. Chris Cruz, who did did our grading, and Ben Solovey, Benjamin Solovey, who did the restoration, the 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 preservation work done in the seventies by Richard Simonton, the Library of Congress taking care of these films, and the video that Crystal Kai did with Steve Massa, and the artwork by Mar- Marlene Weissman. It all comes together, and it's just I'm very pleased with how well it's been received. So we we have. For Undercrank Production, this is our 24th release, and we have a, uh, at least a half dozen wow. projects um, in the hopper right now with a, a few more uh, over the horizon for 2022 and 2023, if DVDs and Blu-rays and any of this still uh, exist at, 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 that, at that point. Um, but we, the, the, uh, the, the workflow that I've, I've uh, either discovered or pioneered or whatever of of uh, crowdfunding by fans and 
uh, uh, manu manufacture on demand as a way to get the, 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 the product out uh, has been really, really effective for not only yeah. for me, but so many other people like uh, Dave Glass and David Wyatt and the things that they're doing uh, with, with, with comedy shorts. Uh, it's it's been it's just just uh, being part of this movement to get stuff that it isn't a Buster Keaton film uh, out to the fans who want to see more than just Buster Keaton and, and Harold Lloyd is it's been really uh, gratifying. So uh, people who want to stay in touch should definitely subscribe either to my blog or go to silentfilmmusic.com and get on my email list. Um, I, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, but you never know if you're going to miss a post. But if you Get on the email list. I will send an email to you, and you'll get it. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Ever Edward Everett Horton is definitely on the Christmas list for me because uh, I, I mean, I, I only know him from the Fred Astaire films, and I love him in those. I think he is absolutely super. Yeah. So I'm just so intrigued to see him in the silent pictures. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, yeah, and you can almost hear his voice. His persona was already set in the in the, in the 20s. Right. That we, the one that we know him for. Yeah. And the films because they are produced by Harold Lloyd. Uh, the production values are, you know, you watch the, these shorts and every once in a while you have to pinch yourself and remind yourself, no, I'm not watching a big budget Paramount feature. This is a too real comedy. <laughs> but the, 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 yeah, they're so extremely well made and the gags are wonderful yeah. and the, they're, they're just a lot of fun. Brilliant. Brilliant. Ben, thank you so much for taking time out today to spend uh, talking with us about Laurel and Hardy and everything else besides. It's been an absolute treat. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Oh, uh, thanks so much for having me on on on, on your podcast, and and uh, here's to more people uh, discovering, finding, and sharing the fun of Laurel and Hardy uh, in the years to come. I'm into that. Absolutely right. Thank you ever so much, Ben. Lovely to talk to you. All right. Well, that was such good fun uh, talking to Ben today. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, it's almost time for us to meet our second guest. Uh, we're only halfway through. Um, but uh, before that, let's have a short musical interlude. Well, if that was short enough for you, let's bring out special guest number two. I'm thrilled and honoured to say that joining us on the blogcast today is Neil Brand. Neil has been a silent film accompanist for over 30 years, performing throughout the UK regularly in London at the Barbican and BFI National Film Theatres, and also at film festivals and special events around the world. Training originally as an actor, he's made his name as a writer, performer and composer, scoring BFI video releases of such films as South, Shackleton's Journey to the South Pole, The Ring by Alfred Hitchcock, Fairbanks' 1922 epic Robin Hood and Charlie Chaplin's Easy Street. As well as working frequently with the BBC Symphony Orchestra, Neil is well known as a TV presenter on BBC Four with his hugely successful series Sound of Cinema, The Music That Made the Movies and Sound of Song – and he's a regular presenter on BBC Radio 4's film programme. Of extra special interest to fans of Laurel and Hardy, Neil is also a prolific radio playwright, including the Sony and Tinniswood nominated drama Stan, which he later adapted for BBC television. He has twice toured the UK with comedian Paul Merton, as well as appearing in and supplying music for Paul's TV series Paul Merton's Silent Clowns. Following the COVID pandemic, Neil is now back touring the UK with his live shows, highlighting the work of our own Stan and Ollie, and also the great Buster Keaton. He's a fellow of Aberystwyth University and a visiting professor of the Royal College of Music, and is considered one of the finest improvising piano accompanists in the world. So it is with enormous pleasure that I say Neil Brand, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. Thank you, Patrick. It's very nice to be here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure, Neil. The pleasure is all mine. I'm so excited to have this opportunity to chat with you, um, as I'm a, a big fan of your work just generally, um, but also uh, and, and listening to you talk about music and films. So this is a real treat for me, um, but especially because it was your score for your Don Tootin that really brought that film alive for me. I remember um, I, I sat down to sort of critique the film, if you like, when I wrote my first blog a couple of years ago, and I've just left feeling really 
disappointed. Um, and I remembered your program you made with Paul Merton um, and that you'd composed this, this score. And so I rooted it out, found it, and it was just, it just blew me away. It was absolutely perfect. So I'm, I'm thrilled that you've come on to chat with us about it, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is start off, as I do with all my guests, and just ask you a little bit about your, your Laurel and Hardy backstory, if you like. You know, what are mm. your earliest memories of them and how you were introduced to them? I think, like most people of my age, because I, I was a teenager in the 70s, uh, I probably came across them first on TV when there would be sound shorts dropped into the schedules from time to time. I think, seem to remember Saturday mornings, you'd get a couple of Laurel and Hardy shorts. And I think I probably knew about them before I first laughed at them, if you see what I mean. Yes. You know, this it's like most silent comedians. The assumption is that they're for children. Actually, they they weren't intended to be for children. They were intended to be for everybody, to make everybody laugh. And kids don't always necessarily get uh, possibly Chaplin, but actually even Chaplin is quite hard for kids to get. So Laurel and Hardy, for me, were icons before they were, I think I can now say, pretty much my favorite silent comics. Right. They started life as a very recognizable pair. There was something wonderfully inevitable about watching everything go to pot as you watched them begin whatever job it was. And I don't remember when I was very young any particular scene or any particular film sticking in my mind. I just remember seeing them. And, I, and I, as soon as I see them in my mind, I see them in shirt sleeves and braces and bowler hats. Yes. Trying to get on with something, you know, uh, whatever that may be. Proper sense of, of Lauren and Hardy probably didn't hit till I was at university when... Uh, again, they were still on TV, but there was much more of a sense that actually I kind of got them rather more than I had before. Yeah. Because what I was starting to enjoy about them wasn't just the knockabout. It was the character comedy, and it was how they established, and I think this is always a difficult one with comedy, how they established a comedy partnership. Yeah. And I've gone on till now trying to analyze what makes them the perfect comedy partnership because they defy a lot for me anyway of the assumptions about comedy partnerships they may have started off big guy and little guy but their actual comedy is much more than that it's about somehow or other a shared personality it's about a personality that that they both contribute to and if one of them's not contributing the whole thing won't work but unlike, say, Little and Large, which I remember Clive James memorably describing as two men sharing one parachute, <laughs> 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 um, there really is a sense that Ollie can't be Ollie without Stan, and Stan can't be Stan without Ollie. And the amount they bring, both in comic and dramatic terms, is absolutely 50-50. Yeah. And I still find that astonishing, because they're going through so many different scenarios. And they're at so many different places on the social scale as well. That, that amazes me. There always was an assumption that the funniest comedy, particularly when you get Depression-era comedy, comes from people right at the bottom of the social scale. That's what Chaplin established in the teens. But actually, they're just as funny as middle-class husbands yes. who've actually got a bit of disposable income. Um, they are pretty funny. I mean, now that I've finally had a chance to properly watch and properly enjoy Duck Soup, the first film of theirs, yeah. in which there's a kind of ersatz social standing between them, whereby Ollie, they're both tramps, but Ollie assumes he's some kind of aristocrat, and Stan <laughs> kind of goes along with that as his servant. Yes. Even there, there's a kind of a neat sort of dovetailing of the two of them together. And, you know, that, that they can't maintain the fantasy individually they've got to be you know side by side to be able to do that so then i think the big the big the big sort of breakthrough came when i'd started playing silent films and i discovered they'd made silent films i don't think i knew 
before I started as a pianist in you know, mid 1980s, right. that there was this huge amount of silent material. So from then on, I was hooked. And up until now, my respect for them and my love for them has just grown and grown and grown and grown. That's lovely. Yeah, I mean, that was going to be the, the next sort of question. You know, what do they what do they mean to you today? You know, because obviously, as I said in your intro, you, you're you're touring. I think now um, mm. your Laurel and Hardy show again. You know, it's, so they're obviously a big so. part of your life. They are now for me. I think they provide a kind of a a, a pretty open armed accessibility to pretty much everybody. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I enjoy about going out particularly with comedy and silent comedy is that as a piano player you get to ride the waves of the laughter you actually have to time your music right so you can't tread on a laugh any more than you know someone in a sound comedy can sort of bust in across an audience absolutely loving what they're watching yes and with a silent film you haven't got the problem that how Roach expressed about, you know, well, we've got to extend the scenes so as to allow audiences to laugh at a line before we hear the next line. You haven't got any of that problem. What you do have is this wonderful sense of riding the coattails of a couple of great comics who are going over very well, usually with people who haven't seen the stuff they're watching. They may have seen Lauren and Hardy before. And I've had a huge number of people come up to me saying, I didn't like Lauren and Hardy, but I do now, and I really oh, laughed at that. Brilliant. And there, brilliant. Are, there are people who are sort of like, you know, crying, with la- helpless with laughter. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. they now mean to me actually slightly more than Keaton because I, much as I adore Keaton, he's from a surreal world. He's from yes. a, a world, I think of it as an existential world, in yeah. which he's going to die at any minute. <laughs> unless he does something to prevent yeah. that happening. Yeah. And that's fine, but we don't go through lives quite as appalling as that, whereas we do go through lives very, very similar to Stan and Ollie. Yes. Having scraped the edge of my car this morning for no reason whatsoever but that I was pulling into a parking space, oh, no. I am Stan and Ollie. And it was a real kind of, you know, look to camera moment <laughs> where, I, yeah. where I realized what I'd done, you know, oh, uh, no. uh, there is something about them that they still managed to timelessly match our domestic misfortunes. And I think that's, that's what they mean most to me today. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. We, we could just relate to them so easily. Yeah. And that's, that's where mm. we, that's where the affection I think comes through as well, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we, again, in the intro, I mentioned the radio drama Stan that you wrote. Mm. Neil. I just want to just touch on this mm. a little bit, just because it's such an interesting piece. Uh, I watched it again a few nights ago, uh, the, the television adaptation. Um, mm. where, where did that come from? Neil? What was the sort of inspiration for it? I'd be really interested to know. Well, initially, I wrote it as a radio drama, um, and I was fascinated by the idea. In fact, it turned up in the, the idea for it, the germ of the idea for it, turned up in Simon Lewis's book, Stan okay. and Ollie, The Roots of Comedy. And I'm just, look, I've got it here, and I'm just going to have a quick look and see if I can actually find the line. I bet I know which it, one it is. Go on. <laughs> it's when... Ollie has had his stroke Mm. and it's a line along the lines of people said that when Stan went to visit Ollie, they could only communicate with gestures. They were reduced back to their silent film personalities again. And I just thought, wow, that's fantastic radio. I'd written quite a lot of radio drama by then. But the idea of two men in a room, one of whom can't speak, yeah, was, and also to be able to basically relive and re-celebrate a couple of lives that were so worth celebrating. Yeah. And the extra element of trying to piece together what it was that made a comedy partnership. Because I have to say, I don't believe a single word of Stan's line, we never had a, a crossword. I, right. I'm sorry, Stan, bless your heart. <laughs> but two men do not hang out that long in so many stressful situations as trying to make a film without a single crossword. Yeah. So I just thought, <laughs> right, so let's let's go behind the partnership a bit and see a little bit more. 
The other reason for it, which um, I have spoken about before, but it, it's sort of, it's the major push behind it, was that I was on tour in Australia, touring with a silent movie down there, when my dad died back in England. Oh. And I hadn't been expecting that at all. Right. So I didn't get the last goodbye. Hmm. So I wanted to write a piece which would also be a chance to, in effect, not exactly have the last goodbye with my dad, but find out what it was like for someone who loved somebody who knows they're seeing them for the last time. Hmm. Yeah. And then what is it they're going to say? And particularly if they've got unfinished business. And it struck me that Stan and Ollie's business, for all that long, long partnership, right up to Atoll K, mm. there must have been things they hadn't said. Yeah. And Stan must have known damn well that if they were going to be said, they were going to have to be said then. And it was much more likely that Stan would have unfinished things to say to Ollie than that Ollie would have unfinished things to say to, say to Stan. Mm. So that's why I wanted to write it. And I have to say, yeah, I think it was my idea that we should go to Tom Courtney for it. And so once I'd done the script, it was posted so that it landed on his, on his front door mat and he took it on. Um, and that was just wonderful. Yeah. So then when the chance of doing the telly came up, they made it very clear BBC four that they wanted it opened up from what it was. They didn't give us anything like the budget to open it up, <laughs> but they, they did say they wanted a script that included earlier shots yeah. and, you know, sort of, you know, earlier versions of themselves, which yeah. is how we ended up with two stands and two ollies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that was really where all that came from. Right. Um, That's fascinating. It's sort of, well, it's just it's it it was enough to get on with the the play. Yeah. Uh, but then I was very lucky with Tom. Uh, we also, you know, we were able to do wonderful things. You and Bailey, who's the other actor who played Ollie for me, is kind of a man of a thousand voices. Right. And he was able to give a real sense of of Ollie being there, even though we couldn't see. Holly. Right. And that thing of uh, the point at which, you know, that the lump in the throat moment, the point at which we know they've hit uh, something that is going to be a, a massive moment for them both and they've got to deal with it. Actually, I was even more pleased with how that worked on telly than I was with radio because right. I, I, I very much, I didn't, I, I knew that we couldn't just reproduce on TV what we did on radio. So it had to be a reinvention, really. But the moments, and this was very much down to John Sen, who was the director of the TV version, the moments in which we just eluded, just straight, you know, almost in a second, from young Stan to old Stan, and from old Stan and, and Ollie to their bedroom selves, as it yeah. like their bedroom version. I loved that more than anything else. You know, I, I came up with a few of those transitions. I wanted to do the one uh, from, I think it's County Hospital, where they pull the 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 the, the screen across. Yes, yes. He jumps up and grabs it and pulls it down. I wanted to do that. That was a but nice touch. Some of them it was just really gorgeous, and yeah. you know, the the telly was also, I have to say, a product of our lack of of budget. We were given so little money to actually make that thing. With we're talking what. 15 heading for 20 years ago but the budget to produce the whole thing was less than a hundred thousand pound wow for wow. one hour of period tv that doesn't show i mean it's a it's a beautiful it is a beautiful <laughs> thing it's a really really it's, lovely it's, piece and uh, Thank and, you. and knowing and knowing the backstory as well with your own father there that that just yeah. so many sort of pennies drop you know the way that Ida says to stan you're really lucky to get this time with him you know that it all kind of makes sense now so i understand that you know, Edith said something I didn't understand, but but I do now. She said I was lucky to have this time with you. And she was right. Now, I never said this before. All my life I wanted to make it on my own. You know, be a lone star like Chaplin. But it never happened, and deep down inside I knew it never would, because I didn't have it, and it, it burnt me up. But then Roach teamed me with you and the two of us we had it oh yes just as funny as chaplin just as famous and just as loved 
You know, at home, I have old piles of fan mail, you know, up, right up to the ceiling. <laughs> for, for both of us, babe. And, and I think people write to us because they need us. You know, they need to know that we are there. And it's not just them. I mean, you know, when you go, I'll just go back to being Stan Laurel again. You know, who means nothing. No, you wanted the truth. Well, in, in a few days, in a few days, I'll probably get a call from Lucille to say that babe is gone. And I won't come to the funeral because I'll either make a fool of myself or I'll say something inappropriate. And that's why I'm saying this now. I'll, I'll stay at home with Ida and I'll look out at the ocean. But all the time, I'll be writing new material for us in my mind, you know new routines and gags and all it'll take will be just a, a headline in the newspaper you know to get me thinking about us going out with brushes or going door to door or trying to uh, trying to <laughs> trying to avoid the wives <laughs> but I know that I'm just passing the time you see when you're here all my comic thoughts and that's most of my thoughts they, they have meaning but when you're gone you know it'll just be the dreams of an old man who's got, who's got too much time on his hands. Oh, don't go, babe. So today we're looking at Jordan Tutin, um, the mm. film in focus for today. Mm. And music is obviously a massive part of that film. Uh, as I said, mm. it, it's something that when I, when I saw this, the standard, my standard DVD version of it, it just... It, all the all the gags were missed. The whole bandstand scene, yeah. the gags were just not there. They just it just sort of bulldozed over them. Um, and I think out of their early films, there are two films that stand out for me that are, that were very brave for the studios to make. One was Leave Them Laughing because it relied yeah. so much on the sound of laughter and the, the contagious yeah. element, which wasn't there in a silent film. But they, they pulled it off. They, they did a great job. Mm. And then Your Don Tooting, of course, is all about certainly the, well, throughout the whole film, it's about the musical sound. So uh, mm. incredible that they decided to make that film in the first place. Um, but yeah, I, I'd love to hear about your your score and how you sort of approach that that whole process because it is it, it is mm. a wonderful thing that really binds that film together and makes it work. Thank you. Um, it was Paul initially, Paul Merton. We'd done lots of sort of chatting around movies and the ones that we loved, and obviously Jordan Tooten came up out of that and. We were due to be making the series, and he very much wanted to do Jordan Tutin, but he was he was sort of saying, you know, isn't it extraordinary? Two things. One, that as you say, it's a musical film in which there's no music on the soundtrack. You've <laughs> yeah. got to provide it all yourself. Yeah. Two, that is Edgar Kennedy directing. Yeah. And that Edgar Kennedy's take on, you know, the way that the gags you can get out of music and so forth, spot on, tremendous. Um so Paul actually commissioned me to write the music for that initially. So he basically, he's, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say, I think he still gets PRS for it. So right. uh, he's <laughs> hopefully it's, I, I'm sure it hasn't brought him in anything, but hey. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was very much for the TV series and sort of proven to work uh, in terms of the the live audience in two ways one was to make the band fit with what we're watching on screen yeah yeah so i felt very strongly that those first few uh moments in the bandstand where they're not playing and the conductor's trying to get them to play you can't hear a band if it's going to work the band's got to be there to over the titles yes but then it's got to disappear we've got to be uh, forgive the term, we've got to be diegetic at that point. In other words, the music is only what we see on screen coming out of the screen. <laughs> then beyond that, um, I really kind of was interested to see how far, how close I could get with uh, the immediate stuff, you know, the sort of the very tight cueing. So where where they play, whether I could actually get it that a band would hit that just right at the point where they were supposed to. I wasn't, I was conducting this from the piano. So uh, it, we didn't have a conductor. We didn't have anybody in front of the screen. I was just playing and making the, the thing work to tempo as best I could. Right. And then bringing people in when they were supposed to come in. So things like the, uh, 
which you know that's got to hit right on because that's the moment when the hat then falls out of his hand yeah and then the woman steps on it and you've got to have that <laughs> at that point yes because there was a bit of me also that was remembering those very first times i must have seen some of the silent material on tv because they would add these absolutely spot on sound effects to yeah. you would have the ding thud yeah. etc that's right now I th- my jury's still out whether that made it funnier or not, or whether we could actually have just put up with music through as, as we would have done. But I wanted to put a few of those moments in, and I always yeah. have done with the scores that I've done. Yeah. So stuff like that, being able to get a percussionist watching the screen whilst we were all playing so that those moments were absolutely spot on. And then that delirious last you know, 10 minutes. And I thought in that, well, that's the point at which we get the audience to join in. Yeah. Because, you know, the, one of the things about Laurel and Hardy, they are about play. They're about being kids and about enjoying playing. And I remember going to see the clown Slava Palunin and Slava's Snow Show, which was this fantastic theatrical clowning show where it was just basically him and a and other clown on on stage together but it ended up two things one was the most wonderful big snowstorm off the stage into the auditorium where suddenly everybody was surrounded by bits of paper that were actually just snow and then right for the very end on he came on stage and pushed two enormous balls out into the audience when i say enormous they were about 25 feet wide and the audience sat for a quarter of an hour pushing these balls up to the next layer of the theatre or across to the other side. So there was this auditorium with two massive rubber balls, my running. My thought with Jordan Tooten in the audience was, why should they be allowed to tear people's trousers? Yes. So we gave the audience bits of cloth. And I also hauled out two people to do the punch in the stomach and the kick in the knee because I, I love that. <laughs> I love reciprocal violence anyway. Yeah. And that, for me, really needed... Doof, Bang. <laughs> and so that's what we ended up with in the live shows. Yeah. While the audience, while the band just went bananas over that last 10 minutes. So I wrote that lot. We did it as a recording. We did it as a live recording in Port Only for uh, Paul's series, which was horrifyingly disastrous because we were given a cut of the print that was different to the one I'd worked in. <laughs> oh, no. So what you actually get to see in that final thing is a, an amalgam of two different performances of the, of the score, one in which we were able to actually play it through as it was supposed to be at the second one in which we sort of fell apart. But then since then, what's been wonderful is that I've played it live, ooh, seven, eight, nine times with different bands and with a conductor. And that is just such a pleasure. Um, there's a conductor I work with in Sussex called Steve Dummer, and he and his band have done it. He did it, first of all, with me in Dartington. We did it in Dartington Hall with great, great jazz players. So it's two really good trumpet players, two really good um, trombonists. So you've got a lovely big brass sound there, great rhythm with the drums and bass, and it's such fun to do, and they really enjoy it as well. And then... Um, that now has gone into sort of my repertoire. So I'm actually able to take the film out with the band playing live and do that, do that, you know, so do everything that we were able to do with, with Paul's show, but actually do it live. And I hand out bits of paper to the audience and I tell them, you know, rip away. Don't do it too soon because there's, this is a long sequence of trouser ripping. Don't leave it too late, otherwise you'll end up with a bit of paper you can't use. And, you know, just have fun and then put it in the bin afterwards. And it does make the audience part of the band. And it's, again, one of the beauties of it. It's, it's such a joyful thing to do, but that comes entirely out of the joy of the initial film in the first place, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I love that, yeah, as you are saying about the, the bandstand sequence, the silence just really focuses the attention on the action, which it doesn't happen mm. in the other versions, right down to um, the conductor's baton, you know, and he, he yeah. taps his bat and it's, he focuses straight away on the action. And it's just, it works so well just to have that silence and the, you know, as the orchestra are preparing themselves is just 
Brilliant. Really, really brilliant. Well, that's um, the other fun thing for me was that I had the battle. So I, I was the one doing that on the music right. stand of the piano. Uh, so that's the other thing. I'm not playing during that point. I'm just sort of watching the screen and I can yeah. get tick, tick. And I think <laughs> I, I've worked it out now that it is tick, 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 and yeah. then tick, tick, tick. And then I think the next one is just tick, tick. And then <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of thing where you pride yourself on nailing every single one. And you also, you know, you wake up screaming in the middle of the night if you miss any of them. So it's a, <laughs> it's a challenge, but it's always one worth rising to. Well, I bet if, this, if, if there's a Laurel and Hardy quiz and the, the answer is, the, the question is, how many times does the baton get tapped on? You've probably got that one nailed, Neil. I think you'll be in the lead. I think I <laughs> might have. <laughs> do you do you prefer to accompany a film um, sort of ad hoc, or or do you prefer to do it as you've done there with a, a sort of a, a composed piece? I love playing just piano for Stan and Ollie because um, the big difference is that when you actually write a score for a film, you have to pretty much basically say, okay, if this is going to be for posterity, if this is going to outlast me, this score. I'm going to have to get it right. So you do tend to sit and sweat over every second of the film. Whereas when you sit at a piano, especially if you've got a, a, an audience rocking with laughter, you're partway through the show. It's just fun. It's lovely to be there. But you can try new things out. You can be that bit more anarchic. You can see if this particular idea works with this moment. I'd, I'd tell you what's been for me one of the most successful ad hoc performances, which I still do now. And I'm actually quite loath to try and do it with a with a band because it works so well with the orchestra. Of all things is Liberty. Oh, yeah. Because Liberty for me, I'm not a huge fan of the music on Liberty, the original score. Because the problem is it keeps saying, oh, isn't this funny? Isn't this funny? They all look at the funniness of what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. Actually, what makes it most funny is if the music's saying they're going to die. Yes. They really are up that high. So I play that film with a continual sense of utter jeopardy. So as soon as they're up on top of that building, I just play it like they could fall to their deaths at any second. And then I leave them to do the comedy. Yes. Because that right. way, and I, I discovered this with, with Buster Keaton. If you play Buster Keaton like, you know, uh, just, oh, isn't this daft clowning, you will kill everything stone dead. But if the moments where, you know, the moments where Keaton's literally hanging on by his life, if you play the jeopardy of that, the potential dark side of that, what he does is fantastically funny. So there's only one moment in Liberty where I, I flip the coin and that's the point at which Stanley's hanging under the girder and Ollie's <laughs> on top of the girder and he's hanging on to Stan's shoe. And <laughs> it's just after Stan has very nearly collapsed off the ladder. The ladder has gone over the side and Stan has managed to hang on to the girder. And it's before the main girder goes and leaves the building and Stan's clinging onto it. It's just a moment at which there's, it's just so much fun. It's no longer Jeopardy. They've proved they're never going to get hurt. So there's no point in the music suggesting they're going to get hurt. And there's a wonderful moment in that, which, if you're not careful, goes for nothing, because you've actually got to make the music pointed out, where Ollie is pulling Stan up from underneath and he's himself starting to overbalance to one side. And he suddenly looks at the camera and goes, what the hell am I doing this <laughs> Push his stand back down again. <laughs> and it comes back up. And it's just such a wonderful moment <laughs> of where Ollie stops being an altruistic mate of stands and turns back into a human being who realizes he could fall off the girder and die at any minute. That's it. Yeah. And Perfect. Moments like that. So that's the sort of thing, you know, you can catch those moments from the piano much more easily because you're not trying to concentrate on fixing the music to the to the picture and making sure that it all hits at the right time um and that that's that's one of the beauties it really is that's brilliant i was just going to say you you must have to know the films very well to accompany them off the cuff but you've just proved that you know them very well <laughs> Neil. that's uh yeah we could well it's that. it's funny I, I i don't know them as well as i think i do in some instances I was so pleased to be able to see Wrong Again this weekend, which I haven't seen for ages and ages and ages. 
And I had completely forgotten. And I think maybe now I'm much more attuned to a close analysis of what I'm playing and a close analysis of what I'm watching. But that entire sequence in front of the curtain, when Stan and Ollie realize the blue boy is a painting (laughs) and what they've done is put the horse on the piano. That shared moment between them, where they both suddenly tumble to how ridiculous what they've done <laughs> is and they yeah. fall about <laughs> and then and then they kind of keep the, getting little glances through the curtain to make sure it's absolutely true what is it <laughs> yes it is <laughs> yeah. that is a moment i have yet to hit musically because i've only just discovered it for myself i've right. only just realized for myself yeah. just how brilliant that is because not only does it extend the moment of of you know final discovery that the horse is on the piano, so that it holds off the owner finding out quite how appallingly badly he's been serviced <laughs> by Stan and Ollie, yeah. but it also gives you a chance to just really enjoy it in depth. And I noticed something. I don't know whether I'm on the wrong track here. Your listeners will know far more than I do. But Stan and Ollie are in middle close up an awful lot of the time in that film, particularly in front of the curtain. And usually I'm used to seeing them. If you see them in Jordan 2, you hardly get any close-ups at all. In fact, it's nearly all head to foot. Whereas seeing them that close in and seeing the two of them taking up the entire screen, so you've literally just got them shoulder to shoulder that early, struck me as quite, that felt like quite a big leap uh, into a more intimate take on Stan and Ollie. Right. Um, all the films that I'd got used to playing and which I love playing are the very, really fair, comparatively very early ones. So, you know, um, uh, big business, obviously Liberty, um, uh, the, that finishing touch stuff like that, where it's almost all knockabout and it's all full length. Yes. Yeah. This was the first time I'd seen them just sort of stand there and interact with each other in a very small way, but really quite close up in the camera. And that was beautiful to play. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Oh, sounds great. Sounds really great. Um, so can you just describe in your own words what you think the purpose of the music and silent films is, what it, what it should actually do for the audience? Well, it's different from film to film. Um, I do think that the main purpose of music today for silent film is to provide a bridge between the age of the film and the age of the audience. And that is getting harder and harder and harder. There are some films that are just unplayable in front of a modern audience, uh, either because the film itself is just so archaic that it doesn't touch our modern lives at all we you know it's very hard to find a sympathy with it or that it has attitudes that are just you know so much old right. a century ago yes you know, it's, it's tougher to yeah it's very tough to be able to mediate something like that but with with the boys it's the same i think for them as it is with all the other comics and a lot of the other dramas which is that as well as trying to provide music that fits both what they're doing on screen and what my audience is used to. I also want to try and provide music that shuts out the rest of the world. So I don't play anything anybody recognizes, although it's nice to hear a nice little warm ripple when you, when you hit the, the cuckoo song at the top of a Lauren and Hardy film. That's, not, that's lovely, just because it's a laugh of recognition. But apart from that, I'm going to avoid anything that anybody might hear from anywhere else. I'm going to try and make the music lock the doors of the auditorium and focus the audience in on the screen and, and make the music sound like it's coming out the screen at them. Not that I'm putting something on it, not that I'm sort of, you know, supplying music from myself from down the front, but that, it's a kind of inevitability that what's going on on screen is generating this score, which is helping what's happening on screen to happen. And that's that's the main job. So with, with Stan and Ollie, and again, this is another reason I love them as comics, what I find I can do a lot of the time, which I can't with Chaplin and can't very often with, with um, certainly not with Harold Lloyd, is I can relax back. 
with Harold Lloyd, Chaplin and Keaton, you've got fast moving comedy and you've got a sense of momentum which has to be kept up. Right, yes. With with Stan and Ollie, I can come right back in terms of the tempo and indeed the style. I use very slow stride blues a lot with Stan and Ollie because it just feels like a kind of world in which not a lot mentally is going on <laughs> so yeah. i think i'm trying to play their inner life you yes. know what i mean yes perfect um, <laughs> whilst they're standing there dressed to the nines supposedly being waiters for a party giving that a lugubrious slow feel to it actually really helps because again it's down to them then to do the comedy i'm not trying to make people think this is funny i'm just trying to make people feel this is a nice easy bed on which stan and ollie can do what they do and as things then ramp up and you know fights break out or they start smashing cars into each other that's different but the natural place and again coming back to liberty it's wonderful that you start Liberty at 100 miles an hour as they're running away from the prison. They get in the car. They finally jump out of the car. And if you take all of the heat and pressure out of that moment and just take it right down to a very slow blues, that turns out to be exactly the speed at which they're going to realize they're wearing each other's trousers. <laughs> it's not very fast at all. Yeah. It's a slow recognition of what's happening. And after that, it's a fairly slow process of beginning to realize there's a crab in one of those pairs of trousers. So, you know, that, that's, that's, that's really what the music's trying to do with Laurel and Hardy is to give a world in which their comedy makes some sort of sense. And that's another reason why I've always had problems with Keaton. I can't yet find that world. I can do a piano version of Keaton's world, but, I've tried loads of different combinations of instruments with, you know, sort of cabaret style, um, vaudeville style. Right. Um, and it's, it's very hard because his world doesn't exist. Yes. His world existed entirely in Keaton's imagination. Yeah. It's like trying to say, oh, well, I'll, I'll play the piano for the perfect Terry Gilliam world. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> yes. You know? <laughs> very good. Whereas... Stan and Ollie, I, I kind of get where they're from, and they, they are a lot easier to play for. Yeah. It was interesting what you just said at the start there, Neil, as you, you said that you, you, you try uh, or you're in, you intend not to play anything that's sort of recognisable. So do mm. you, don't, you don't sort of drift into, you know, Leroy Shields' music or, or Marvin Hatley's. You, you, do you steer clear of all of that? Well, the, the actual tunes, yes, I don't get into those, but I very much take those as... A starting point. I right. very much took that as the starting point for um, Jordan Tutin. Yeah. Because the what I went into once the things get moving towards the end of the of the of the of the film. That's very much in the Leroy Shields style. Yes. Although without as much tune to it. But I did make a tune out of the opening of the film. So I, I took the words Jordan Tutin. And so the tune is which is pure Marvin Hatley. Yes. It could could so easily have come off you know, one of those Bohunks tra tracks. Um, so yes, that very much. And also the lineup, it felt to me like a sort of a brassy lineup with a bit of uh, clarinet in there. Um, and it, it just had a good feel. So I was sort of, um, uh, I was, I was in their world, at least from the point of view of, of, of what I was doing. But again, when I'm scoring for a film, rather than worrying too much about the musical style that I'm bringing to it. I am trying to bring what I think is an authentic feel for the actual moment, moment by moment in the film. Um, less so, obviously, with something like Jordan Tutin, but with a film 
uh, like the you know the first film I ever scored for full orchestra was Hitchcock's Blackmail, and with that you have some fantastic sequences in which all you've got to do is try and imagine how it feels to be that character in that moment, and then write the music write the music that comes from that, and then it doesn't matter if what you sound like sounds like Marla or Leroy Shields or whatever you've you've hit upon the music that would be right for you as it were when it comes to to doing that um okay so neil just um to to finish off because we're a little bit uh, short for time i'm going to just ask you now um about uh, oh so our atoll question i have to ask you our atoll question mm. so you are mm. about to be stranded on a deserted island uh, sorry under des- deserted atoll i should say <clears throat> but you are being allowed to take with you four laurel and hardy items with you um a silent short a talky short a feature film and a laurel and hardy related book um which what would you choose and can you explain briefly why uh, yeah, well, the silent short I'd take almost certainly <sighs> now. <laughs> is, <laughs> it was very soon the moment to go. <laughs> yeah, is wrong again. I would have said I would have said big business because up until right. I saw wrong again, I think I think biz, big business is one of the great comedies of all time. Yes, Lauren Hardy or otherwise, but it's just been pipped now for me by Brilliant. wrong again. Yeah. Um, because of their interaction with each other. I think yes. that's what really makes it for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sound short, probably County Hospital. I love that film. Okay. And it's so full of unexpected stuff. But also, they're such an old married couple. <laughs> and, yeah. and the moment at which <laughs> Ollie hits Stan over the bedpan, over the head <laughs> of the bedpan, is has got to be very nearly my funniest moment in all Lauren and Hardy. And yes. then all that Stan does is just rub his head. That's right, as, if, yes. as, like, as if it's barely hurt at all. <laughs> yeah, that's right. How do you feel? Fine. I didn't expect to see you here today. Well, I, I didn't have anything else to do, so I thought I'd drop in and see you. Thank you. You're welcome. What have you got there? I brought you some hard-boiled eggs and some nuts. Now, you know I can't eat hard-boiled eggs and nuts. If you wanted to bring me something, why didn't you bring me a box of candy? They cost too much. Well, what has that got to do with it? You didn't pay me for the last box I brought you. Have one? No, I'd rather not. Hard-boiled eggs and nuts. Mm. Um, the features are toughy. Uh, yeah, it's got to be between Way Out West and pro- I don't. I think Way Out West just about pips it over Sons of the Desert for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I love the musical interludes. Really, I think Way Out. I'd, yeah, the fact that you've got the dance and you've got. Um, uh, the song in in Way Out West, and it's also really nice to see Finlayson doing his stuff as well. Oh, uh, I'm Miss Roberts' guardian. What do you want to see her for? Well, we have some very important news for her. Oh, what's it about? Well, I'm sorry, sir, but we're not supposed to discuss that with anyone but her. Yeah, you see, it's private. Her father died and left her a gold mine, and we're not supposed to tell anybody but her. See. Didn't we, Ollie? A uh, gold mine? It's the biggest thing this Now night. that he's taken you into our confidence, you might as well know the rest. Although it's lovely to see Charlie Chase do his stuff in uh, in 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 the other ones. So I'm uh, they are very neck and neck. Those they two. are. I'd agree with that. But, yeah. Yeah. Surely, as a musical, um, as a musical man, you're going to have to go way out west. I probably do. Yeah. Probably <laughs> do. <laughs> And then um, the book, without a doubt, the Simon Lubish. Um, I just found that so full of really wonderful pearls. Yes. The other thing is that on my deserted atoll, I can read that book and I can see all the films in my head again. Because he makes a, good a very point. good job, I think, of conjuring all those all those films up. But also, there's so much life in there. All the stuff that I ended up putting into the TV version of Stan, 
the idea that they were making Way Out West, one of their funniest films, when they were both being sued for divorce by That's their wives. Right, yeah, absolutely right. And this, it, what it did for me, the book, more than anything else, was that it took away this sense that there was any difference between the two guys on screen and the two all too human men playing them. Right. Because you couldn't get away from context time and time and time and time again. Yeah, yeah that's a really good and point. still for me, you know, I, I still find it extraordinary that those two who were who they were and who embraced all that wonderful film, but also things like the, the bells being rung at Cove when, yes. uh, when they arrived and generally being as loved as they were right the way around the world. Yeah, you know, the, the two of them were the way they were and that that was so extraordinary. And I'm sorry, I'll put my hand up to it, but the film of Stan and Ollie didn't begin to touch on what it was that kept them like that. They were going through tough times, but there was something extraordinary about them. And Lubish's book gets as close, I think, as we'll ever be to really being able to properly dissect those two extraordinary men aside from the films they made and the characters they played. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer, actually, Neil. It, it, is a, it is a great book, and it's it's not mentioned anywhere near enough, I don't think, the Lubish book. The, the, the issue I have with it is the chronology is a little bit all over the place with the, the way that the films were, were sort of produced. It sort of jumps backwards and forwards a little uh-huh. bit too much, and I get a little mm. bit lost. But what I do like is what you say is the the context that it gives you between the, mm. the films and what was going on in their private lives, and that's something that I try and do with the, the blogs that I write, the articles that I, that I write. So... Really good answer. That's a great answer. Um, and uh, just fi- a final question for, well, actually two final questions for you, uh, Neil, before you go. Have you got any p- uh, current projects that you'd like to plug whilst you've got our ears? Well, um, I've just heard, which I'm very pleased about, that I'm going to be scoring the uh, the Shackleton film South for the BFI for a, a new Blu-ray release ah, and uh, a live show, which is tremendous. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things up in the air, uh, some exciting stuff for next year. Uh, apart from that, I'm going, I'm back on the road with the boys again, and I hope that I will be bringing them to a cinema near you wherever uh, over crossed. the next six to 10 months. Um, yeah. I've only done this show in Scotland so far and in a couple of venues in England. So I'm very much hoping I'm going to be able to uh, get Laurel and Hardy out on the road certainly over the next year or so with a, with, with a bit of luck. Brilliant. Brilliant. Keep spreading the word, Neil. Absolutely great stuff. Uh, and I will certainly look out to uh, to see if there's any shows coming near me because I'd love to see that, um, especially if, if you're doing things like Liberty, you know, which I've not seen yet uh, with your, your yeah. scores on. That would be fabulous. Um, and your final question that I have, um, the, the piece of music that I usually end every show with is uh, Leroy Shields, if uh, if only it were true, uh, which is a mm-hmm. cracking little tune. But as you are uh, a musical man, Neil, I'd like to give you the opportunity of selecting um, a Laurel and Hardy related piece of music for us to close today's show. Well, the one that I love is <laughs> it's Laurel and Hardy related. It's not actually Laurel and Hardy, but it is for me a wonderful, funny piece. And I'm pretty sure it ended up on some Laurel and Hardy film. Right. And that is, uh, I think it's Marvin Hatley rather. It might be Leroy Shields' um, Gangway Charlie. Oh, yes. Which yes, yes. is the piece that he wrote mainly for Charlie Chase. But it's just so musical. It's got such a lovely energy to it. Uh, I just really, really like it. Uh, I'd like that one to go out on. You Talk certainly may, sir. That was wonderful. And uh, just a huge thanks for spending the time with us today and coming on, Neil. It's been brilliant, as I knew it would be, to listen to, uh, to you talking about the music of Laurel and Hardy and your Don Tootin especially. So um, hopefully you'll, you'll come on again and, and have another chat with us another time. I look forward to it, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, that really was a bumper episode. Two great and incredibly talented guests with two very different ways of scoring your Don Tootin. And that just about does it for episode 17. Your homework for next time is to watch the boys' silent short, Their Purple Moment. And remember, you can get in touch with me by email at laurelandhardyblog at gmail.com or by joining our Blogheads Facebook group. You can read today's blog for your Don Tootin and all my other blogs on more of the boys' films by visiting blogheads.com. And in addition, you can proudly show your love for the boys and your support for this show by ordering something from my range of merchandise from our Redbubble store. 
Links to all that and more can be found in the show notes as usual. So my thanks to Ben Modell and Neil Brand for being fantastic guests. I also want to thank one of our blogheads, Tricky Springs, and also Richard W. Ban for some invaluable help they both gave me um, uh, for the rewrite of today's audio blog. And last but by no means least, a thousand thanks to you for listening once more. And until next time, it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye.